Thanks, Dorn. Um, so yes, uh, I'm going to try to introduce uh, the idea of extreme value analysis to you. Uh, how many of you are familiar with extreme methods, extreme statistical methods? So most of you. So that's so that's great, and that's not surprising uh, when you talk to uh, uh, an audience who's involved in climate science. There have been some statisticians. Uh, several here right at NCAR, Rick Katz and Eric Gilland come uh, immediately to mind, who've done a very good job of describing uh, and, and conveying the, the, the message of the, the, the gospel, I suppose, of, uh, of extreme value analysis and why it's the appropriate method for trying to talk about the tale of the distribution. So um, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. I'm going to talk, I'm going to touch on two different projects. And so uh, Miranda Fix and Grant Weller Miranda is a current student at CSU. Grant was a former student. And then Steve, Melissa, and Linda are, are here at, at NCAR. So um, the, the outline of my talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a bit about climate models, because of course that's why you're here. And you guys know more about climate models than I do. So why am I going to talk about climate models? Well, I'm going to describe climate models from a statistician's point of view, because you might be interacting with, with statisticians, and they're not going to understand the things about the models that you understand. And, um, and so it, it, it might help to, to do that. Then I'll, I'll give some very basics of, of extreme value analysis. We'll fit a GEV to some data. And then I'll talk about what's typically done with extreme value analyses of, of climate model output. Then I'll talk about a different type of climate model study where we're, we're assessing extremal correspondence. This last bullet, I'm, I'm almost positive we won't have time to get to, and that's fine. OK, so you've seen this quote. Uh, what's the difference between climate and weather? And, and the, the quote that often is used is, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. And that word expect has a very specific connotation in, in statistics. Expected value means mean. Okay, And so climate is often summarized by means, and that's a perfectly reasonable way to summarize a distribution. Um, and people use 30-year averages to, as, as an estimate of the, the climatological mean. So this is a, and, and this quote is, is I, I, I think, is very useful in trying to describe the difference between climate and weather to the public. But I can't use this quote if I want to do an extreme value analysis, because what I want to talk about is the tail of the distribution. And if we're just talking about the expected value, well, we're not in the tail, right? And so the way I think of climate is that climate is the distribution from which the weather is drawn. And of course, that distribution can change with location. That distribution changes with time. And of course, the goal of, of climate modeling is, is largely to understand what the distribution of weather is going to look like in the future. Um, so of course, uh, how will that distribution change is, is, is a, a topic that everybody would like to know. OK, so explaining climate models to statisticians. The, Basic idea that when, if, I, if I'm talking about, well, I'm analyzing climate model output, I, I'll, I'll say that a climate model is a tool for simulating weather under different climate conditions, which of course ties in with that definition that we saw on, on the previous slide, right? Um, and if I say that to statisticians, they say, OK, I understand completely. Because statisticians do simulations all the time. We'll do it on our little laptop, but we'll run something in R. We'll draw 10,000 random variables, and we'll talk about the distribution, and we'll fit stuff. And, 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 the, and the statisticians say, I got it. And then I have to say, no, you don't. Because these climate models are very different than the simulations that we run on our laptops, right? And of course, they're huge. They take teams of scientists and the largest computers in, in the world, and so that has to be explained. But the, the main point that has to be explained to them is that this simulation is deterministic. It's not a life simulation in R where there's some stochastic process that's, that's underlying how we're drawing from some distribution. The way, at least, and I, and I know this isn't entirely true, but it's, it's, it's important to convey to statisticians that if I set up the climate model with initial conditions um, and I don't change anything, then essentially the, the output I'm going to get out is the same if I run that twice. And that's not true in the type of simulations that we run, right? So that's an important thing to get across. Of course, the other question that often comes up is, why do you run these simulations? And of course, it's because we can't perform experimentation. We don't have multiple Earths where we can set the, 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 the 
greenhouse gas concentrations and other forcings to, to some level and see what, what comes out. And so climate models are our best tool for running these experiments. I talk a little bit about how climate models produce output rather than data. And in the climate science world, people talk to think of data as observations, although observations aren't always looking at thermometers, as we know, if you're looking at reanalysis or gridded, uh, gridded product or something like that. And then I talk a little bit about how you, the climate science world is very careful to say what we'll talk about future projections of climate, not predictions of, of climate, and then a little bit about that. And then there's this idea of, of uncertainty which gets tossed around in this community. And, and, and I, of course, I'm a statistician, so, so you may not agree with, with uh, my interpretation of, of what uh, the climate scientists call uncertainty. There's uncertainty due to the initial conditions, right? If you set your initial conditions one way and you run your model forward, and then you set them another way, you run your model forward, the weather that those models are going to produce over time is going to differ. And so the way I think of that, it, those, it, that uncertainty due to initial conditions, which, which often gets talked, I, I think the, the phrase that, I, that I've heard is internal variability. That's the, that's the internal variability of the model. And if you set those initial conditions to two different values, you'll get two different summaries of the mean climate, right? They'll be slightly different. Um, well, the st statistician's interpretation of this is this is just sample variability. You're, you're, you set the initial conditions and you, and you run something, and if you were to do that a different time in a different time, you'd have more samples, right? And the, any summary statistic you get from that run um, is going to differ from each of those initial conditions. And this is something that we're very comfortable with in, in the statistics world. I know that it's very difficult to talk to the public about that, but in, to a statistician, that's, that's not a big deal. There's the parameter uncertainty, and the way I envision this as a statistician, the way I envision this, this climate model is there's this giant black box with about 100 dials on it, and, and the climate scientists are the best scientists in the world to know just how to set those dials to reproduce reasonable climate. But of course, if we tweak this dial up and that dial down, then we're going to generate different output. And so that's the idea, in my mind, of parameter uncertainty. And that guy's a little bit harder for me to, to find a, a, an equivalence in stats land. It's sort of like a prior. You, you're, you've got these parameters that you're, you're, you could draw from a distribution, you could imagine. And there, I know that there are some experiments that are sort of run that way. But of course, it's forward running, whereas if you're a Bayesian statistician, you, you have some, some prior, and you gather the data, and you work backwards to try and make inference about those parameters. So it's a little different. Um, and then, of course, there's model uncertainty. And this, this was uh, very much the focus, I believe, of, of Ben's talk uh, just prior to this, that NCAR's model is going to produce different output than Hadley's model. And this isn't so hard for a statistician to understand either, because I think it's somewhat like model mismatch. We know that any model you produce is going to be wrong. And, um, and so um, we're somewhat used to that, OK? So that's kind of the way I think of, of climate models. Now, there's a difference between output and observations. I'm going to be focusing on the tail of the distribution, things like the annual maximum precipitation. And the, of course, this is of interest because people need to build bridges that are going to last 100 years out. And it'd be nice to know how that extreme precipitation is going to change in the future. And I just want to note that this is a little, Ben talked about the tail of the distribution in his talk. And what he, his response, his, his variable was climate sensitivity. And his draws from that distribution were the different climate models, getting back to, to our previous slide. And, he, and some climate models live in the tail of that distribution. I'm looking more at just, I'm not doing a multi-model experiment here, OK? So that, that's, that's a very valid distribution to, to talk about the tail of. I'm going to think about something different. I'm going to think about the distribution of the tail of the distribution of the output itself. So we're going to look at precipitation primarily in this talk. OK, so here is in black are the, um, is, a, is, a, is an estimate of the annual maximum precipitation recorded at Boulder, Boulder's station. If you're familiar with Boulder, you might know that there was a big event in 2013 where we got about nine inches of rain um, in a day. So this is annual maximum daily precipitation. And this is what we observe at the weather station. And then this is what is produced by the CESM, CMIP-5 model. And it's different. 
And, that's, and I think that that's not surprising to anybody in this room. And I don't think that if we look at this difference, you, you throw up your hands and say, well, climate models don't say anything interesting about extreme precipitation. Because what the climate model is producing is different than what we record at a weather station. A weather station is at a point location. A climate model is somehow interpreting over this grid. And if you want to study extreme precipitation, neither of those values might be what you really need if you want to run your hydrological model or something like that. So you, so there's, you need to take whatever, out, whatever information you've got, whether that's observations or whether that's model output, and probably do some sort of converting to make it useful for building your bridge or whatever your application is. So although this distribution doesn't match, I don't know that it should, um, but hopefully what the climate model tells us very good information about is how that distribution can change. And if, I, and if my distribution of interest is really that point location at Boulder, well, hopefully knowing something about how the distribution of, from the model output run under historical forcings changes to under some future forcings will give me information about how the point location in Boulder might change in the future. Right? And that idea is downscaling. And there's dynamical downscaling where you take your GCM and you run an RCM and you try to make the, the grid smaller or some other sort of dynamical downscaling. Or you can just do it statistically where you build some sort of model which says, if my output looks like this and my target distribution likes th looks like this, I, I build some statistical model that will switch between the two. OK? <clears throat> and um, I know you're familiar with all these, and I'm essentially going to skip this, this slide, but it's when I talk to statisticians about climate models, well, of course, there are different types of models out there. There are the big GCMs, which we're working with uh, with the CMIP-5 data, and of course, their grid boxes are large, and so they're good for studying large-scale changes, and, not, and of course, you have to also say, okay, they're going to produce some weather for this grid cell for January 1st, 2050, but of course that's not our weather prediction of that. That's just, we have to think of that as a draw from the potential distribution of weather on January 1st, 2050, right? There are regional climate models, and the reason I bring this, uh, this appears on this slide is some of, one of the projects is going to look at RCM output. And then there are reanalysis products, and the, those are the, the products, as, as you know, that, that take data, observational data from somewhere, and produce model-like output. And of course, the key about the reanalysis products, which a free-running climate model, either GCM or RCM, don't do, is that they should exhibit correspondence with the observation. Somehow, the weather that's produced for today for the grid cell in Boulder, Colorado, ought to mimic what, we see, what we're actually seeing, right? We don't think the, the, the reanalysis product should have it rainy outside on today. And, and that's an important idea to get across for one of the one of the projects that we're hopefully going to look at. Okay, extremes. The goal of an extreme value analysis is to describe the tail of the distribution. We don't care at all about the bulk of the distribution. There are great methods. If you're interested in the bulk of the distribution, there are methods for, for doing that. If you're doing an extreme value analysis, we don't care about the mean or the variance. We just want to characterize the tail. And so an extreme value analysis does something that seems very strange at first. We throw away all, most of the data. We'll throw away 95% of the data, or 98% of the data. In finance, they'll throw away more than 99% of the data. Because all the, they're really worried about is what's going on in the upper tail. And, and heuristically, the idea for that is, hey, the data in the tail tells you about what's going on in the tail. And the data in the bulk of the distribution doesn't say anything about the, the data in the tail or, or the, the behavior on the tail, OK? So why do you do that? Well, let me try and illustrate this with the Boulder flood of, or the Colorado flood of, of 2013. So um, it really was a week-long event. It, we had this strange atmospheric phenomenon that was funneling a whole lot of moisture up to the, the northern front range. This is right from NOAA, and this is the total precipitation uh, over this essentially week-long period. And you can say, so here's Denver, Boulder. Here's my home in Fort Collins. You can see that Boulder is in one of the darkest areas here where there was, there was an awful lot of rain. Um, and in Boulder, most of the destruction occurred, or a lot of the destruction occurred due to a flash flood event. So on September 12th, they got nine inches of rain, which is just an absurd amount of rain 
uh, in a 24 hour hour period and of course the infrastructure could not handle that now the the, the destruction was not limited to Boulder this is a, a picture of the big Thompson Canyon which is here west of Loveland essentially you could not drive from the Front Range to the mountains from Denver to the Wyoming border for the weeks after this because all of the roads had disappeared and this is one example of, of where that had happened now NOAA who is who um, the HDSC, Hydro Design, the HDSC, <laughs> is the, they're the, they produce official government estimates of extreme precipitation. And this, I, as I understand it, is what gets used by people who need to build bridges and things. And so if you use their tool, and you can go online and get official government estimates for extreme precipitation, essentially, they said, well, they say that the 1,000-year return level for 24-hour precipitation is 8.16 inches. So we're sort of on the order of, um, and you can see that, that the actual estimate falls within that confidence interval that they give. So we're on the order of a 1 in 1,000-year event, according to the official government estimates. OK? OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to perform an extreme value analysis. Um, and we're going to look at the Boulder precipitation record. Here is daily precipitation for the summer months. I'm defining summer as May through September. And I, and I recognize that that's probably not a stationary distribution. Pre precipitation in July is probably a bit different than precipitation in September. But hopefully the extremes are stationary enough uh, through this, or, or, or uh, by looking at summer, it's, it's not too seasonal that I can apply one distribution. I'm going to analyze the data in two ways. I'm going to model all of the data. So I'm going to do the thing that I just said don't do. I'm going to take the entire data set. I'm going to model. I'm going to fit a distribution to that data set. And I'm going to try to estimate how rare was that Boulder event. And then I'm going to do the same where I use uh, extreme value analysis. So here we model all the precipitation and data. And of course, precipitation is a strange variable from a statistician's point of view because it's got a, a non-zero probability of being exactly zero. And then you've got some probability of being non-zero. But we can deal with that uh, by, dealing, by uh, thinking of x as a mixture distribution. So x is exactly zero with some probability. And, and we get an, a non-zero measurement with a probability p. And we can estimate that probability just by the uh, empirical frequency. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this non-zero data and I'm going to fit a gamma distribution to that. The gamma has two parameters. I can estimate those parameters. I, I did via maximum likelihood here. And this is the fitted distribution to that non-zero data. You see here's the histogram of the non-zero data. Here's the fitted distribution. And you look at that and you say, not so bad, right? At least I do. OK, so now let's use that fitted distribution to estimate that really rare event. So the 100-year return level, based on that model that we just fit, is 2.39 inches. And there's our confidence interval for the, that uh, estimate. NOAA's estimate, notice, is double that. So we can see that by fitting the entire distribution, we're getting something that disagrees fundamentally with NOAA. And the return period of the 2013 event is 161 billion years. So this is very different than NOAA's estimate. And we can see that we've done something wrong. Here is a QQ plot of the data. Here is a, a, a line which represents the fitted distribution. And you can see that we missed, we missed entirely. We missed the tail entirely. But what's important and what's not well shown in this is that less than 1% of the data are greater than 1.25. So essentially, 99% of the data are down here. And we're fitting 99% of the data really well with that gamma distribution. But we're missing the, the tail of the distribution completely because you've got 99% of the data screaming that k and theta ought to look like this. And this 1% out here in the tail says, no, you don't have that right. So what we've got to do is we've got to fit something. Uh, we've got to do. Um, we're going to, we'll see in, in, in two slides what happens when we do an extreme value analysis. Now, you could look at this model and say, well, Cooley, you got it wrong because the gamma has a light tail and we know precipitation doesn't have a light tail. And I would agree with that statement entirely. 
We can fit a different distribution. People like to use the log normal distribution as a, as a quote unquote heavy tailed distribution, although it, it is not heavy by the definition of heaviness in extreme value theory. But if we do the same thing, we fit the entire data set with a log normal distribution, we get a 100 year return level estimate of 10 inches. So that says, oh, Every, every 100 years, you can expect to get a, an event like that in Boulder, which again is very different than the NOAA estimate. And the return period of the, the 2013 event would be about 69 years. But importantly, if we look at the QQ plot, we see that we miss the tail again. This time, we, the, tail, the, the data says the tail is lower than this fitted log normal. So the takeaway message is it's not necessarily the model's fault. It's that you, when you try to fit one distribution to the entire data set, you will often miss the tail. So in, a, in an extreme value analysis, as I said, what we do is we take a data set and we extract some data set which it, we consider to be extreme. And there are kind of two methods which are used. One method is to do block maxima. And the block maxima idea says, well, break your data set into blocks. In the atmospheric sciences, sciences a very natural block is a year extract your maximum from each year, and then fit a distribution to just that data. So fit a distribution to your annual maxima. The right distribution from probability theory to fitting block maxima is the generalized extreme value distribution. Another approach is to set a threshold um, and to keep all the data that exceeds that threshold. And um, extreme value analysis says the right distribution in that case is the generalized Pareto distribution. Um, the challenge with using the generalized Pareto is to choose a, the right threshold. And there's some art to that. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about that. But either of these, if done appropriately, um, from an extremes point of view, is, is, sort of, is the right approach. If we do a GAV analysis of this same data, data set, I've only got 64 data points all of a sudden because I've thrown, so I've, I'm, I've got 64 years of data. Now I've got 64 data points. All I'm showing are those 64 data points. So these are all extreme values in some sense. We've thrown away most of the data, um, but we can see that we fit the data much better and we get a more believable estimate. Our 100 year return level estimate is 5.12, which essentially agrees with NOAA's. Notice that NOAA's confidence interval is a bit more narrow than mine and that's because NOAA is doing some fancy things to try and borrow strength across locations rather than just using the data from this one location to estimate the, 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 the distribution at that one location. The return period estimate of the 2013 year event with our fitted GEV is about 1654 years. So, or was, so um, and you can see that the uncertainty with that guy is enormous. And the uncertainty with that guy is enormous is because I've only got 64 data points to fit this guy. And so there's a lot of uncertainty associated with the parameters of the GEV distribution. Why is the GEV right? Well, let's not think about extremes for a second. Let's think about the center of the distribution. Why is the normal right for the distribution of the sample mean? You know, the, the answer to that is the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem says if you start with a distribution, you draw a sample from this distribution, you calculate the mean from that sample, and you plot the, mean, the sample mean, and then you do that over and over and over again, the distribution of the sample mean converges to a normal distribution. The power of the central limit theorem is this. It doesn't matter what distribution we start with, so long as it's got a finite variance, if our sample size is large enough, it's going to converge to a normal. So the normal is going to be a good pro approximation for a large enough sample from any distribution that we've got over here. It doesn't matter whether I'm starting with a gamma or a log normal or anything with a finite variance, it's fine. So that's the power of the central limit theorem. We have a similar theorem from extremes that says if you start with a distribution, you take a random sample of some size, you, you take the maximum, rather than me, the mean of that sample, and you plot it, and you do it over and over and over again. As your sample size increases, you're going to converge to a max stable distribution. There are three types of that max stable distribution. There's a Gumbel, there's a Frechet, and there's a Weibel. And essentially, all that means is that the, anything with a heavy tail, anything whose 
Any underlying distribution whose tail is decaying like a power function rather than an exponential function is going to converge to a fresh A. Anything that has an exponential tail, like a normal or a gamma, is going to converge to a gumbel. And anything with a bounded upper tail is going to converge to a weibel. In terms of atmospheric variables, we generally find precipitation has a heavy tail. We generally find wind speeds and temperatures have bounded tails. Um, so that says, OK, there are three types of distributions. But the GEV is just essentially an umbrella class, which encompasses all three of those distributions. The GEV has a CDF, the cumulative distribution function, given by this guy. And you don't need to memorize this, but the, 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 the distribution. But recognize there are three parameters to that distribution. There's a mu, which is not a mean, but it's just a location parameter. So if I have a GEV with a fixed mu, sigma, and C, and I change mu, it just picks up that distribution and moves it. Sigma, as you might think, it's not, a, it's not a standard deviation or a variance, but it is a scale, so it's just going to spread or, or shrink that guy. And C is the parameter which determines what type of tail I've got. So if C is positive, I'm in the heavy tail case. If C is 0, I'm in the light tail case. And if C is negative, I'm in the bounded tail case. Okay, And then the value of C, um, the more positive it is, the heavier the tail you've got. The GPD, which I talked a little bit about, um, has it, it really has three parameters. You see the C parameter, and that C parameter is exactly the same for the GEV, so it determines the type of tail. This sigma is essentially a scale parameter, and the location parameter is essentially determined by the threshold you choose, U. Okay? So you can imagine, as a statistician, if you're given a pile of data, you either extract block maxima, and then you fit the three parameters of the GEV, and you talk about the uncertainty of, associated with those parameters, and you can talk about the uncertainty associated with things like return levels uh, for, from the uncertainty associated with those parameters. With a GPD, you just you choose a threshold, which again requires some art. Um, but then you estimate those two parameters, and, and away you go. So, so statistically, with these models, things aren't that difficult. And then we can, we can talk about return levels. Return levels are, are defined in terms of the annual maximum. If you're, if you're unfamiliar with the, the, the term return level, you're probably familiar with the 100-year flood. And a 100-year return level is, is essentially the equivalent of a 100-year flood. But of course, you can talk about the 100-year return level of wind speeds or something like that. But the return level is the probability that the annual maximum will exceed some level with probability 1 over, say, 100, if you're talking about the 100-year the return level. So the definition of return level is in terms of the annual maximum. The GEV, if you want to know, if you want to go from GEV to return level, it's straightforward. Because the GEV is already talking about the distribution of the annual maximum. Essentially, you just solve for the high quantile, and you're done. With the GPD, the GPD is talking about the distribution of the individual guys exceeding the threshold. And so you've got to go from that to talking about an annual maximum. And there can, if your data aren't independent, if your daily data aren't independent, which is generally the case in atmospheric science, then you have to account for the dependence when calculating that return level. And that can be done. OK, so let's do this really quickly. Um, what I have is I have uh, output from a uh, large ensemble of the CESM model. This was produced um, as, uh, as at least the, how we came into this to obtaining this data is we were involved with the BRACE project, which was looking at um, differences in, in climate model projections. And we had this very nice large ensemble to play with. So what I have is data, which is stored. So I'm, I'm working in R here. And if I. Um, There's this object called past maxima, which is a list. And the length of that list is 30. So in fact, what we have are 30 ensemble members. Each element of this list is a different ensemble member. We're going to kind of ignore that we've got this multiple ensemble. I'm going to look at output from just one of these runs. And so um, let's see. Uh, if I, the dimension of the first 
element of that list is 86 by 47 by 27. What I have is 86 years of historical data uh, that ends in 2005. So if you work your way back from 2005, I think that's, well, that started 19, 20. 47 by 27 is, is just my uh, study region. We concentrated just on the continental United States. Okay, so what we have here are, this is, a, this is an array of annual maxima. So I, I look at a grid cell, I take all of the year's data, I extract the annual maxima, and I store it in this array. So we've already done the extraction process. And I'm going to multiply by this constant so that we transform the units that are inherent in the climate model output to, to millimeters per day. And let's see, I'm just going to define longitude and latitude in a nice way. This is sort of the pre in a very small way, the pre-processing that Ben was talking about. Um, and then let's just take a pic, let's look at a picture of this. So I'm going to read in the fields package, which is, was developed right here at NCAR. Here is a plot of the first year's annual maximum, maxima. And so what we see is that um, there, in this year, there may have been a particularly large storm down here, probably just right on the coast of Mexico. And maybe there was a, a large event that, that occurred um, here in Louisiana. OK. Um, and so I'm going to look at the Fort Collins grid cell, which is, if you can see, I should have plotted it in some other color, but there's a grid cell right here which corresponds to Fort Collins. And I'm just going to analyze the data from that grid cell. Okay? So um, I'm going to essentially, this line just extracts that time series at that location. I'm going to use the extremes package, which is developed here uh, by Eric Gilliland. And there's this tool called FEVD in extremes, which will allow you to fit either a GEV or a GP, uh, a generalized Pareto, or there's this point process representation. And then there's some other, uh, essentially, if you fix C to be 0, you can fit a Gumbel distribution. And this is a, an incredibly flexible tool. Um, it allows you to do all sorts of things. And of course, the downside of having such a flexible tool is you've got to read the documentation to make sure you're doing exactly what you want. But once you've done that, you can see that it's really easy to essentially all I've got to do is give it the data I want to fit, tell it what I want to fit, and it will spit out an object which I've named Gev Fit Out. And here's what we get out. We get parameters. Here's mu and sigma and xi. Notice that xi is slightly positive, and so that says that the point estimate uh, is slightly heavy tailed. Notice the, here are the standard errors. And if you do sort of your um, just in the head 95% <coughs> confidence interval, you double this and you center it at that. And you see that, oh, wow, we've got a whole lot of uncertainty associated with this shape parameter because the confidence interval would include both negative and positive values. And that's one takeaway message from this is that the shape parameter is often very hard to estimate, which is bad news for us in extremes because that guy really talks about how the tail decays. That's something we'd really like to estimate better. And so there are ways in which you can borrow strength across locations, make some assumptions that, well, the tail parameter in the, for the Fort Collins grid cell is very similar to the tail parameter at a nearby grid cell, and try to, tr try to decrease the uncertainty associated with that. Um, this is a covariance matrix, which talks about the uncertainty. Essentially, if I take the square root of this number, I will get that number. That's just the square root of the diagonals. But it also tells how these parameter estimates are related to one another. And here are some, some model selection diagnostics that get spit out as well. You can use the return level function to spit out the, the estimated return level. So I'm going to just give it what was produced. By fitting it, I'm going to tell it a 100-year return level. And alpha equals 0.05 just tells us uh, what it, that I want a 95% confidence interval. And so let's see. Oh, then if I, the, so if you do return level, it just spits out a point estimate of that 100-year return level, 5.61 units. And those are, that's. Um, 
okay, I didn't do millimeters, I did centimeters. So this is centimeters per day. Rec recognize, hey, that if you think back to our picture of distributions, that might not represent the distribution at, a, at the point location for Boulder or for Fort Collins, but this is the, the estimate for this climate model, what the, the, what the climate model output says. And then we can get a return level using Eric's confidence interval uh, tool. And here, so here is a normal based 95% confidence interval. Uh, Eric and, and would immediately say the normal based assumption is not a great assumption for producing a, a confidence interval for return levels, but it's an easy one. And it's a nice way of conveying the amount of uncertainty you get. Okay, so there are, you could get more sophisticated with how you produce that, but at least we get some idea of the uncertainty we've got from that. Okay, <laughs> so jumping back to the slides, the summary for an extreme value analysis is let the tail speak for itself. We fit only a subset of extreme data because any single distribution we fit is wrong. The non-extreme data, if we fit a, a, data, a, a distribution to the entire data set, the non-extreme data overwhelm the fit, and so the tail is typically poorly fit. Um, also, we, we really, if we fit the entire data set, we'll underestimate the uncertainty we've got for the tail, too. So we use a distribution from extreme value theory because probability theory says it's right. There's that max stable law that says, doesn't matter what distribution you start with, the distribution of the annual maxima should converge to a GEV. Now that says your block size goes to infinity, but for a relatively large block size, the GEV should be a good, uh, a good approximation to the true uh, distribution of the annual maxima. And of course, the power of that is we don't have to understand, we don't have to know what the underlying distribution is. No matter what distribution we start with, the, the block maximum should converge to a, to a GEV. And then the other thing that's useful often in, in um, applications is you want to extrapolate. In, 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 you might have 50 years of observational data in Boulder, but you need to say something intelligent about a 100 or a 200 or a 500 year event. And these extreme value distributions give us some justification for extrapolating from the data we've got to saying something intelligent about a, an event that occurs more rare than the, the data set we have. OK. So I got to pick up the pace now. Extreme analysis of climate model output. Well, we just did that. So what I'm going to look at what is often done is that um, people want to characterize the climatological or the marginal behavior of extremes. Um, so you've got this, this model output, and you say, OK, what does this model say for extreme precipitation at this location? And what does it say for extreme precipitation at this location? And maybe I run that model with some future projection, and I say, OK, what, under this future projection, what do we uh, estimate for the uh, extreme precipitation in, in 100 years? <clears throat> so what's typically done is you fit a GEV or a GPD at each location independently. And this is easy to do. You can imagine setting up a for loop to do exactly what I did over the continental US. right? Um, and this is used to contrast current and future behavior and, and just say something about uh, what this climate model says about extreme behavior. And these, if you, it's easy to find examples of these types of, of analyses in atmospheric journals, in Journal of Climate, and so forth. Right? So uh, Miranda Fix, a student of mine, we were involved in a, in a project where this was the goal. And we were using output from CESM. Uh, this was the CMIP5 output. And as I said, we've got um, this output from an initial condition experiment. So we've got this um, unusual situation where we've got 30 annual maxima for each year. In an extreme value analysis, generally, we're very data poor. You just saw that for the, uh, the Boulder observational data, if I, use, if I do an annual maximum analysis, I, go f I just have 64 data points. Well, this ensemble is, is lovely from an extreme point of view, because now I've got 30 independent draws of the annual maximum from, it, from any year. And so that uncertainty, I can really shrink that down. And that was a neat thing that we could explore with this ensemble. So we have 30 ensemble members for the historical period, 15 for the, the future period. Under this projection, we have 30 members for the future period under RCP 8.5. And so uh, one thing that was interesting is Miranda did a little pattern scaling experiment, which I'll, I'll talk about. 
Now, we want to model climate change, so we want to talk about how the distribution is changing in time. And so there's a, a, an approach that's widely used in extremes, and what you do is you allow your parameters to vary in time. So now instead of having a location parameter that tells us the location of the annual maxima over the entire time period, we're letting that location change with year. And essentially we build what looks like a simple regression model. We've got a, a, a mu naught and a mu one. This is intercept, this is slope, so this is the effect in almost time. What we really regressed on, instead of doing time, we regressed on global mean temperature. So each each year we get a global mean temperature as, as produced by this climate model, and we use that as our regression term. We do the same for the scale parameter, and then this allows us to uh, to model how the GEV is changing in time. Um, so you see two different indices. There's also uh, this index of, of S, and that's just saying I'm going to fit a different distribution at Fort Collins than in Denver and, and each location. And you can do this right in the um, toolkit, the extremes toolkit. Um, I have I had that code. I'm not going to actually run through it, but but essentially it's a small tweak to the FEVD function. So um, this just talks about the if if I were to the, the problem of a pointwise analysis is that if I were to fit each of these guys independently, what I have here on the left is the estimate of C from a single ensemble member. And then here is that luxury I have with the 30 ensemble members. And what we see is we can get a much smoother map. The uncertainties, which I don't show on this slide, have of course shrunk because I've got these 30 annual maxima. And so, if, but in the typical situation, you don't have this large ensemble. And so the, the challenge of a pointwise analysis is that there's a lot of uncertainty associated with these guys. And subsequently, you get point estimates that have a lot of spatial variation. <coughs> Um, so we get parameter estimates. These are parameter estimates for mu. This is mu naught. This is mu one. So this is the slope. So this is how the location parameter is changing in time. Here are the standard errors associated with that. And what this climate model is saying is that the location parameter seems to be changing most rapidly here in the southeast US. This is run under. Um, this is historical with and then moving into RCP 8.5. So those global mean temperatures for the future are being driven by that very, by RCP 8.5, which has a, a, a very strong increase in um, greenhouse gases. Here are our estimates for the shape, the, the, here's essentially the intercept on the log scale of the shape parameter and the slope, and again, we're seeing kind of greatest increases here and, and perhaps here in Nevada. And then what we can do is we can use these point estimates to say something about the, we, we called it the 1% AEP, which is essentially the idea of a return level, but if your GEV distribution is changing each year, it's sort of awkward to say what's the 100-year return level for 2016 and what's the 100 year return level for 2017 because they're different things. So the 1% AEP is AEP is annual exceedance probability. So it just says what's the prob what's the level which will exceed with with probability 1% by the annual maximum. So let's see. This is <coughs> the return level estimate in 2005. This is in 2080 according to um, <coughs> according to RCP 8.5. This is the percent increase. And uh, so we see the greatest increase again in the, the southeast. And then also in Nevada, we get great increase. And that's largely because here the, the return levels were so small. Um, and then this just says, let's see, D is the, oh, this is sort of this is sort of an impacts idea. It just says, what is the percent in 2080, according to this climate model, of what was the 100-year return level in, in 20, 20, 2005? So if, a, if you see 8%, which we see at a couple locations, that's saying the point estimate says that what was a 100-year event is now a 12.5-year event. 
We also compared this to RCP 4.5, and as you might imagine, the return level increase is much less under RCP 4.5. We can talk more about this. I want to move through these results a little, little bit quickly. Five minutes, really? OK. Um, Okay, I'm going to skip the pattern scaling idea, except to just say that because we were regressing on global mean temperature, we have this model which says, you give me a global mean temperature I'll tell, uh, in some year, I'll tell you what mu and sigma are for that year. And so I can, re can produce a, a, um, a GEV distribution and tell you what the distribution of the annual maximum is. Well, if you, if you say, okay, that, we fit that model via the, the data from RCP 8.5, but if you gave me the global mean temperatures from RCP 4.5, I can use that same model without using any model output from RCP 4.5. All I'm using is the global mean temperatures. And I can produce um, projections of what the annual maximum is. And this is, this is the idea of pattern scaling. And this is widely done for means. Uh, we did it for extremes. And the takeaway message was, if you compare the distributions, this is actually the worst case. If you compare the distributions from the pattern scaling to the one that's actually fitted to the RCP 4.5 data, the distributions are effectively the same. And so what this says is this could be a useful tool for, for taking the output from one climate model, fitting the, the output from one projection, fitting a GEV to that, and then using that model to make projections about other scenarios. <clears throat> OK. This goes, this is, I've got one slide on an old study. And this just says, if you have one, if you have um, output from one ensemble member rather than 30, you're going to get noisier estimates. This is the point estimate of C if you do a point-wise realization at, at each location. And what we did in this study was we borrowed strength from nearby locations to try and say, to try and better estimate, narrow the uncertainty associated with this C. And so there are tools out there. You can do something pretty complicated, which is what we did in this uh, example. And um, there are more simple ways to borrow strength from across locations. And often that's a useful thing to do. You produce maps, which I think are more useful to your users than things like this. OK. So we did a different type of, of so I, I, let me, I think this is fun. This is, um, we saw the difference in distributions from the GCM output of annual maxima and the observations. And so there's a question of, is the GCM getting the extreme precipitation right? Well, if you look at the marginal distributions, it's not getting the distribution right. It doesn't match what we're seeing at the point estimate of, at, at Boulder. But maybe that's not really what our target should be. So what we looked at was a different definition of right. So we're, we're changing completely on the, we're moving into the second study. And what we tried to assess was, are regional climate models producing extreme behavior when they should? Essentially, we're saying that the, an RCM is supposed to take these, the boundary conditions produced by something and generate realistic weather inside the box given those boundary conditions. So if we set those boundary conditions from a reanalysis, the RCM should produce weather at a location that corresponds to the weather in the observations. Now, the marginal distributions might not correspond, but what we wanted to know was if the boundary conditions are such that the observations are producing their most extreme behavior, their most extreme precipitation, does the climate model also produce its most extreme precipitation? Whatever the numbers are associated with that guy. I just want to know if it's getting extreme when it should. And so what we did there was we did a different type of extreme value analysis. We, we, what we essentially do is we create a bivariate time series which says here is, here is precipitation as produced by the model output. Here is precipitation as produced uh, as we see in the observations. And is there correspondence in the tail? So I, a natural thing with bivariate data is to look at correlation. Correlation talks about is there correspondence in the center of the distribution? What we want to know is, is there correspondence in the tail? And oftentimes, you can have correspondence in the center of the distribution and not have correspondence in the tail. 
So we had to use a different tool for this. And I have to um, move through this, but we looked at Pineapple Express data. So we were looking at winter extreme precipitation. To create our bivariate time series, we did something which might seem strange at first. We took this region and we search for each day, we search over the region and we produce our daily number by extracting the four by four box of maximum precipitation. And we do the same, essentially the same size box for the observations. The observations are, we're looking at a gridded data product. product. Um, and we just, and we, we take the, the box which is largest. And notice that the spatial locations don't have to match. And when I talk to statisticians, they get really uptight about that. But I think it's, it's easier to talk to you guys about that because, hey, what does it mean for a regional climate model to get the precipitation right? It's got to take these boundary conditions, and it's got to produce extreme precipitation somewhere on that day. And hopefully where it produces that extreme precipitation somewhere ought to be close to where we actually observed it. But I would count it as right if it produced extreme, its most extreme precipitation here and what we observed is there. Okay, so we also looked at the spatial mismatch, but we didn't require the locations to align because I think on this particular day, the WARF G model is getting it right. So we look at the, so I take that output, I create one number from it, I take this observations, I create one number from it, I've got my bivariate time series, and then I look at a, a index which talks about the tail correspondence, and essentially this just says that you fix some a very large quantile, say the 0.99 quantile of that, and you say, given that this guy is above its 0.99 quantile, what's the probability that this guy is above its 0.99 quantile? And that's how we assess tail correspondence. And we look at that. <clears throat> Here we have increasing quantiles. And what we see are the plots from different regional climate models. And these guys are settling out at about 40, at 0.4. Now, you can't look at that and think of it in terms of correlation. 0.4 is actually pretty strong tail correspondence. Because it, 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 if you say the, the output is above its 0.99 quantile, well, you wouldn't expect the the, the, I'm sorry, if the observations were above their 0.99 quantile, you wouldn't necessarily expect the regional, you'd hope it'd be high, but not all the time is it going to be above its 0.99 quantile. From experience, this is great news. So what we took away from this is that the regional climate models were taking those boundary conditions and were able to produce extreme precipitation in the winter on the Pacific coast. Now we did this also for the Corn Belt in the summer, and you know how climate models have trouble resolving convection and, and uh, summertime precipitation in this region. And what we found is not surprising that these guys were very low, and we essentially this says that the regional climate models were not producing their most extreme precipitation when we observed the most extreme precipitation, and you, if you take that a, a step further, it, when the large-scale conditions are such that they should be. And so perhaps not, so, you can ignore the plot on the, on the right. I haven't given you enough detail about that. But essentially, by this metric, the regional climate models are not, produce, are not getting extreme precipitation right. Now, that's not really news to you guys. We cho chose these. Um, examples specifically because we were hopeful that it would get it right for winter extreme precipitation. And we, were, we suspected that it might not get it right for summer extreme precipitation in the Corn Belt. But this is a, very, is a tool, and it's a very easy tool. It's right in R. It's essentially, if you've got a time series, it's, you plug it in and you crank this thing out. This is a tool which would allow you to assess if your model is getting extreme whatever right. Of course, what you have to have is you have to have that daily correspondence, which means you have to have some sort of reanalysis-driven model. Um, with Mike Weiner, um, and, and a postdoc of Mike's is looking at this um, with just reanalysis data and observations. And unfortunately, one of the things he's finding is that if you take an observational product and another observational product, they don't even agree on their extremes. So, Comparing to observations, you got to kind of even cross your fingers there. 
Okay, I'm done. Thank you.